Our text this morning is 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 through 40. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chenaniah, had made horns for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord will give it, deliver it into the hand of the king. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then his spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look. The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. That now Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall say, see on the day that you, when you go into an inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Take heed, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the, troop, the 32 captains of his chariot, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded." The battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot, facing the Syrians, and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound onto the floor of the chariot. Then, as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood while the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken." 
Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, the ivory house which he built and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Israel? So Ahab rested with his fathers, then Ahaziah his son raised in his place. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, bless us now as we come to your word. Prepare our hearts, our souls, and our minds with a ready repentance, a humble zeal for your righteousness, and a godly desire to grasp what it is that you have declared through the life and death of Ahab. Father, please bring us to yourself through your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So it's been a little bit since we've covered Ahab. Uh, When we broke off in the summer, he he wasn't quite over with. So we thought we'd do one more sermon wrapping things up with King Ahab. Now, the text begins um, with observing, in verse 1, that there had been peace between Israel and Syria for three years. The war that had been three years prior had been initiated when Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, attacked Israel twice. And both times, God had given the victory to Ahab because the Syrians had boasted against God and God wanted to vindicate his name. But at the end of that war, if you remember, uh, two chapters back, Ahab had defeated Ben-Hadad, and held him in his grip. Um, And this was Ben-Hadad who we were told that God had appointed him for destruction. But instead of finishing him off once and for all, Ahab not only let him go, but entered into a treaty with him, called him his brother, and bound himself to the king that had boasted against God. Because of this, God sent a prophet to Ahab with a message of judgment. If you look back at the end of chapter 20, verse 42, Then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life, and your people for his people. If you remember, that's the one where the prophet leaves, Ahab sulks, sullen and displeased. So Ahab, um, had he had made peace with Syria sinfully and maintained that, that peace for three years, And then he decides to go back to war with Syria. But when we notice when he goes back to war with Syria, it's not because he wants to suddenly be obedient. Um, He had made peace with Syria and had been actually an ally with the king of Syria in other military campaigns. There's actually a, a, a very famous battle that happened in the year 853 B.C., where 12 kings from the, from the Near East, including Ahab and including the king of Syria, went and fought Shalmaneser III, um, who was the king of Assyria. So you've got Syria and Assyria. Assyria is a much larger, greater nation further to the north, uh, northeast of Syria. And so these 12 kings bound together and went and fought Shalmaneser III. There's a, um, a, a carving of them uh, that's preserved. And so, so Ahab had, been, had maintained his friendship with the king of Syria, but slowly it began to sort of nag him, not that he had been disobedient to God, but that there was this city, Ramoth Gilead, that had used to be um, in Israel's possession and was now in Syria's possession, and it bugged him. And so he finally decides uh, when the king of Israel, or sorry, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, has come down to visit him, he decides it's time to go and take back Ramoth Gilead. Um, So it's important to notice it's not repentance that prompts Ahab to end his peace with Syria, but lust for the cities and power that had been lost to them. And so Ahab allies himself with Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to go and attack the Syrians. Now, it might make us nervous to see the king of Judah ally himself with Ahab. It seems like that's kind of a problem. But we are told, if you look towards the end of chapter 22... Verse 43, we get a little judgment. This is past the end of our text. But we get a little summary statement about what kind of man Jehoshaphat was. Verse 43, And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. So we're told that he was a fairly strong king. He did um, like his father Asa had done and did not turn aside to the left to the right. We're told later on that he banished the perverted persons uh, from the land, but he didn't remove the high places. So he was a fairly good king, uh, but he had uh, flaws here or there. So he was able to ally himself with Ahab in this battle, and he remained a good king, even though it might not have been the wisest thing for him to have done. Um, He wanted, but we're told that before the battle begins, so they ally themselves together, we're told uh, in the section verses 5 through 9, at the beginning of verse 5, 
Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. So we're told that before he goes to the battle, he wants to hear from the Lord. And you should notice, um, depending, I think most Bibles tend to translate like this, if, um, if the word Lord, if you look in verse 5, you see how the word Lord is in small caps, and you just go down to verse 6, towards the end of verse 6, you'll see, go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. You'll see there the word Lord has a capital L, and then a lowercase o-r-d. The difference, the difference between those two is that the, um, uh, the way they do it, the, pract- the custom is, that if in the Hebrew, if it's God's proper name, Yahweh, the, the tetragrammaton, so his four-letter proper name, Yahweh, when that n- name is in the Hebrew, they will translate it Lord in small caps, um, as it appears in verse 5. But if in the Hebrew, if it's the word Adonai, which is a more generic term for Lord, uh, Master, you could use it, a, a wife could use it of her, of her husband, um, but it also can be used um, to refer to God, but it's, it's generic because it can be used of other gods as well. Somebody might refer to Baal as um, Lord with Adonai. So there's a difference between those two words, and you'll notice that Jehoshaphat says, I want to know that Yahweh has blessed this endeavor, that Yahweh is with us as we go forward here. So he asks for a word from the Lord. And, we're, um, and so Ahab then assembles his prophets. He gathers his prophetic host, verse 6. It's a crowd of about 400 men, 400 prophets. And, and it looks like, uh, I guess, 400 is the necessary number to be a respectable prophetic host. If you remember back when there was the showdown on Mount Carmel, we're told that Ahab gathered 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. So these prophetic hosts come in groups of around 400 or so. And that makes it all the more striking later on in the text when you've got this large prophetic host that everybody would recognize that this is, this is clearly a solid group of prophets. And then you have the lone prophet, Elijah, come in and confront them. Or the lone prophet, Micaiah, come in and confront them. So they gave, um, the prophets gather together, and they all give him an encouraging word. They all say, go up. And you notice here they say, um, go up, the Lord Adonai is going to deliver it into the hand of the king. Now later on they're going to start using Yahweh because that's what Jehoshaphat is insisting that they go by. Uh, But here they they have a somewhat more vague term. They say, um, uh, the the Lord, um, sort of ambiguous, will give it into your hand. Now it's implied here, it's implied here that the prophets are not prophets of Yahweh. If you look at verse uh, verse 8, okay, uh, or sorry, verse 7, And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord, Yahweh? Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? The question is how to, how to translate that word still. Some of your trans- translations might say, Is there not another prophet of Yahweh here? Which would imply that they were all prophets of Yahweh, um, but Jehoshaphat wanted one more. Probably a more likely translation, I think, is um, still. Is there not still? Don't you still have a prophet of Yahweh here somewhere as opposed to these other prophets? It seems strange to me to think that Jehoshaphat would hear 400 prophets of Yahweh and say, I just want one more. We need 401 to really know for sure. It makes more sense that Jehoshaphat sees that these are not prophets of Yahweh and he wants to hear from the one true God before they go into battle. So there is a prophet of Yahweh, Micaiah, but Ahab is unenthusiastic about him. And the reason he's unenthusiastic about him, verse 8, is because Micaiah always says bad things about Ahab. You'd think that Ahab would get a clue from that, but Ahab seems to think that that's a problem with Micaiah and not a problem with Ahab. So he doesn't want to hear from, from Micaiah because he knows that he'll say something bad about him. But Jehoshaphat wants to hear from Micaiah anyways, and so Micaiah is summoned. Verses 10 through 14, then, we have two scenes unfold, okay? And these are two parallel scenes, so they're both happening kind of almost at the same time. One scene is unfolding on the threshing floor. Um, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, they go down to the threshing floor, they put on their royal robes, and they sit in this assembly to hear one more time from the prophets, and the prophets are going to speak more definitively. And at the same time, they're sitting there hearing from the prophets, a messenger has been sent to Micaiah to summon him. 
Now the threshing floor is, it's, uh, we're told, is by the gate of the city, and it's a large open place where um, after the harvest, you bring the grain in, you lay it out, and they would have sometimes oxen trample over it. Sometimes they would beat it with sticks, and the idea is that they're trying to knock uh, the husk and the straw loose from the kernel of the grain. So they, they beat it until it's loosened up, and then they would um, sort of flip it into the air so that the wind would blow away the husk and the, uh, and the straw and leave the kernel. So this is the way they thresh, and they remove the stuff they don't want and save the, the, the important part of the grain. Now, if you think about that, that's obviously that's something that's a, um, connected, that's a place that's connected to a certain part of the year, it's, a, it's something you're going to do at one time of the year and the rest of the time, this large open place, and it has to be open for the wind to blow through and remove uh, the, the husk. This large open place is going to be empty. And so it makes for a very convenient um, meeting place. And you'll see this in scripture oftentimes. Everybody gathered at the threshing floor or some sort of decree or judgment was issued at the threshing floor. We might think of the threshing floor the same way we think of the, the fairgrounds. Right, where you've, you've got this public place that everybody comes for one very particular time of the year, um, connected to the end, end of the summer and the beginning of harvest. That's where the fairgrounds, we gather together for the fair, but the rest of the time, this is just a convenient place to hold events. And so that's what they're doing. They meet at the threshing floor and they have the prophets come in and speak to them. And one prophet particular um, sort of um, excels and distinguishes himself. That's Zedekiah. Zedekiah um, comes really prepared for the moment, bringing his own prop. Uh, he brings this, this set of horns that he's going to use to really make his point and drive it home. Horns signify might and power. They're, they're the horns of an ox. And if you, if you think about it in the ancient world, the oxen was the largest engine. It was the largest source of power that you could get. So it makes sense that these horns signify, they picture to everyone, this is power and strength. It's the power and strength to drive somebody out of your kingdom, to move them along. We're told um, in Deuteronomy 33, Moses' final blessing on Israel, he said of Joseph, his glory is like a firstborn bull and his horns like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them, he shall push the people to the ends of the earth. So you get the impression that these horns, they signify somebody who can just drive somebody out of their way. And Zedekiah thought, I'm going to bring these horns and then Ahab will be thrilled to have himself likened to an ox like that. So, Ahab, or so Zedekiah comes and promises Ahab that he is going to drive the Syrians out of this city and they're going to take it back with no problem. Now at the same time that that's happening, at the same time that this is going on, on the threshing floor, this messenger shows up uh, speaking to Micaiah to summon him. Micaiah, the prophet of Yahweh. And he gives him a warning. The messenger, verse 13, the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. And it's literally that with one accord is literally with one, va with one mouth. Everybody has said the exact same thing. All right, We all came with our stories put together. We even had Zedekiah bring a prop. We, we, and we had this one particular message, and it is a really good one. Ahab is thrilled to hear it. He's very excited. It's going very well. Don't come and mess it up. Don't come and mess it up. He says, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. But Micaiah says, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Whatever Yahweh says to me, I must speak because he's a true prophet. He's not just a hired prophet paid to make somebody feel good about themselves. How flattering must it have been to Ahab to have 400 prophets around, crowding around him, puffing up his ego with the horns, promising that he would win a great and mighty victory over Syria. But Micaiah is sworn to come and tell him the truth. It's interesting, the, the rabbis, um, the, the early rabbis said that there's, um, everybody should have known that this was a lie when the prophets come and speak with one voice. Because they said, when Yahweh speaks to us, he always speaks in variety. We hear from a number of different perspectives. And there's always a, a difference of some sort that we have to sit and figure out how it all fits together. The fact that somebody came with this cooked story where everybody repeats the exact same words, they should have known that this was going to be a lie. Um, but Micaiah refuses to be bullied into the party line in verse 14. Verses 15 through 23, uh, Ahab is going to get the real truth. And we learn here a whole world about Ahab in verses 15 and 16. Listen to this. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, 
Go and prosper, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? It's, it's so bizarre how um, everybody is insisting that he hear this one message. Ahab himself insisting that he hear this message, and then he's resentful and he's upset when he hears exactly what he asked to be told. How many times has he said to only tell the truth, and how many times has he been mad at Micaiah for telling the truth? Remember, he's had Micaiah come and speak to him again and again, and every time he says, he only says bad things about me, and so he resents Micaiah. He doesn't want to be told the truth, and then he says, he has the nerve to say here, verse 16, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Ahab both wanted a lie and didn't want a lie. He was deceived, and he knew the truth. He hated Micaiah for speaking hard words to him, but he also was angry here at him for the lie. Okay? He hated him for telling the truth, and he was angry at him for telling the lie. So this obviously puts Micaiah in an awkward position. Okay? Micaiah is in this awkward position. He wants, uh, uh, he wants the lie, but he also wants the truth. Ahab is a bit like the woman who's asking her husband, how, how does this dress make me look? And you're not sure, truth or lie. It's going to be, you don't want either. You don't want either. And so she wants the answer to be positive, but she does not want to be deceived. But Micaiah serves God and not Ahab. So he gives Ahab the real truth. Israel will lose their king. The nation will be like a sheep without a shepherd, having lost their leader in the battle. And then he goes on to explain just how, just what it is that's happening, how it is that this has played out. Verses 19 through 23 are a very strange scene. Micaiah explains here how he has been given a glimpse into the throne room of God. He is seen into the throne room, throne room of God where the host of heaven is gathered. Now the host of heaven is the angelic realm of both unfallen and fallen angels. It includes, and this is the strange thing about the scene, is it, in, it includes the demonic powers that were worshipped as pagan deities. And if you look in your outline, included a list of verses if you want to look that up. We, don't, we won't go through all of them here, but you can look at those. But the, the host of heaven includes all of the demonic powers that the pagans are worshipping. And all of them, the, the unfallen and the fallen angels, are gathered together before the Lord. But even though the host includes fallen powers... They are all under the sovereign power of God. They all have to step before him and answer to him. Now, there's a couple of difficulties with this passage. The first difficulty, I think, is just the weird factor. All right? we, have, um, we have a host of spiritual beings assembled before the Father, including what appears to be fallen demonic powers. It's just, it's just strange. But we're getting a glimpse into a world that we don't often see and we don't know much about. We can just accept that that's what was going on. And if you look at um, the book of Job, you remember the very beginning of Job, it begins with all the hosts of heaven gathering before the Lord to speak to him. And in that host, we're told that one of the people or one of the beings that appeared before the Lord was Satan himself. Um, in fact, a lot of commentators have taken this lying spirit that's sent out um, throughout the church history. A lot of people have asserted that this is Satan that is sent to Ahab. So we have the, the just kind of the strangeness of the setting. And then we have the second problem of the fact that there is a lying spirit that is being sent by the Lord. God sends a lying spirit to Ahab to deceive him. But we know that God cannot lie. God doesn't lie. God doesn't, he, he cannot um, deceive. Titus 1, 2, we're told that God cannot lie. So how, how does that work? How does, how does God send a lying spirit and also be one who does not lie or deceive? Well, for starters, we have to remember there's a difference between God telling a lie and God making use of a liar. There's a difference between God telling a lie and God making use of a liar. Um, there's a difference between God himself sinning, which he cannot do, and God using sinners, which he always does. He is always using sinners. Every prayer re um, request that we have had answered involved sinners working with us uh, to bless us. And so God uses sinners all the time. And the, the most obvious example is the, the greatest sin of all time, the crucifixion of Jesus. You have the murder of the one innocent man, and God was sovereignly behind all of that. He's not guilty of the death, and yet he is sovereign behind it. Um, but there's, so the crucifixion, uh, sorry, um, but still, it is unsettling then to see God sending a lying spirit 
on a mission to lie. Verse 22, he says to the spirit, go out and do so. So it's unsettling then to, have to see God sending the lying spirit to go and lie. Psalm 18 is helpful here. In Psalm 18, verses 25 through 26, the psalmist writes, With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. Clearly, God was shrewd with Ahab the devious. He did sending, send him a lying spirit. God was shrewd with Ahab, sending a lying spirit to him. But if we take just a step back, we see that God didn't really deceive him, did he? And we can see, you look at the situation, actually God did not deceive Ahab. He sent the lying spirit in such a way that Ahab completely knew exactly what was happening, right? Ahab knew the real truth behind it all. He sent Micaiah alongside the lying spirit so that Ahab knew the real truth. Micaiah gave him the straight up truth that he would die in battle. So he, he set up the context in which Ahab could be deceived, and then he set the prophet to tell him the truth. And he set it all up so that Ahab knew this is deceit and this is truth. Ahab knew exactly what it was that he was walking into. So Ahab did hear the truth, the real truth, but he also heard the lies. And God did this so that Ahab could hear not just the truth about his death, but also the truth about himself. He heard that he was a man that loved to be lied to. He was a man that loved to be flattered with deceitful lies. 400 men chanting a lie around him on the threshing floor that he knew to be untrue. And then one voice telling him crystal clear the real truth about himself. He was being shown that he was a man that loved to be deceived, to be lied to. So God used the lying spirit to show Ahab more truth about himself than he would have learned from a direct prophecy. I would say, I would argue that in sending that lying spirit, God was actually showing Ahab more truth, not deceit. Now, verse 24 through 28, um, Micaiah is struck down. Zedekiah strikes Micaiah in an attempt to silence him. And this happens to prophets throughout Scripture. Jesus is struck by one of the officers for challenging the high priest. Ananias commanded that Paul be struck for saying that he had a good conscience. Prophets are beaten and thrown into prison when authorities don't want to hear from them. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Now Pasher, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher struck Jeremiah the prophet, and he put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Jeremiah 37, verse 15. Therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him and put him in prison. This is just what happens when prophets speak the truth. This is how we treat people who speak to us the words that we don't want to hear. We get violent against it. We know the truth. We don't necessarily have a good argument against it. And so we handle it by getting violent against it. As Stephen said just before his own execution, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? When we're confronted with tough words, our tendency is to want to lash back out. And Micaiah the prophet is thrown into prison as he gives Ahab one last chilling word from the Lord. If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. Take heed, all you people. And that last line, take heed, all you people, you can imagine that. that that's the last line that Ahab will hear from a prophet of the Lord as he goes off to his death. That last line of warning. And you get the impression that that line, take heed, all you people, must have reverberated in the ears of the Jews. Um, a century later, the prophet Micah, whose name is derived from Micaiah, um, so he's closely connected to him. The prophet Micah, when you open up his book, the first words from his prophecy is he's quoting right here. Take heed, all you people. He begins uh, with the exact same warning. So Ahab and Jehoshaphat go to battle anyways in verses 29 through 37. And the king of Syria wanted Ahab dead and ordered his troops to hunt for him. He's outraged that Ahab is coming back to battle against him after they had already had this peace. And so he says, everybody, you're looking for Ahab. And you're going to just hunt for him and kill him. But Ahab disguised himself in the battle, thinking that somehow he could cheat death. And notice he does in one sense, because the king of Syria wants Ahab dead, and he orders his captains to hunt just for Ahab. And um, Ahab's disguise tricks them. They go after Jehoshaphat. They realize that he's not the king, and they leave him alone. They want just Ahab, and they're not able to find him. So in one sense, his, his disguise does work. Um, 
However, it's not going to work in disguising him from God. The decree of the king of Syria was not nearly as effective as the t- decree of the Lord. And the description of Ahab's death, really, you can tell, it's, it's, it's written to highlight how it is that this death came um, solely from the hand of the Lord. This was completely and totally from the hand of the Lord, not from the king of Syria. It's the flight of an arrow that was shot completely at random, just, just shot into the air completely at random, finds him and happens to hit him right between the joint of his armor so that it's a fatal blow striking him down. It's completely from the Lord. And the king is taken out of the, bla- the battle and he ends up bleeding to death, leaning in his chariot in fulfillment of, Ahab, or of Elijah and Micaiah's prophecy. The end, of the, book, or the end of the story of Ahab, verses 38 through 40. Ahab's inglorious death fulfilled the prophecies of Elijah and Micaiah, and Israel was left without a shepherd. It was every man to his tents, O Israel. Uh, despite the glory of the building that Ahab, the buildings that Ahab had built, we're told that he built these buildings with ivory, and it's interesting that archaeology has discovered all of these um, ruins with ivory all over the inside of them in the ruins of Samaria. Ahab um, had built this um, uh, in, impressive capital city, and yet it was all uh, going to be left desolate. And over the next few years, his entire lineage was going to be wiped out, leaving absolutely nothing to his name. The entire thing would be wiped out. Now, one of the clear lessons that we learn from the story of Ahab is the complete sovereignty of our God. You see clearly the the complete sovereignty of God. We see it in this description of how Ahab was struck down in this random flight of the arrow that takes him out, that God was in control of everything, every gust of air on that day, every imperfection in the shaft of the arrow and the feathers on it that caused it to fly in exactly the pattern it did so that it struck him just right between the crease in his armor. Clearly, God was 100% sovereign over everything on that day. And we also see God's complete sovereignty over even the evil of the day. He was using evil spirits. He was using sin. God was sovereign over everything. Nothing was outside of his control. Another lesson that flows out of this first lesson um, is the, um, the way that because God is the one who is sovereign over all, his word is sovereign over all. Because God is the one who's sovereign over all, his word is sovereign over all. Our doctrine of sola scriptura, of scripture alone, that that God's word is the supreme authority in our life, that doctrine is wrapped up in God's complete sovereignty. Because he rules everything, his word is the highest authority in our lives. Um, It's not the only authority in our lives, but it is definitely the highest, the supreme authority. And so the one lone prophet who wanders in with God's word is more important than 400 royal prophets making an enormous spectacle. The one lone prophet wandering in off the street with no pedigree, with no degree, with no anything, he comes in and his word is more important than everybody else because his word comes from the Lord. We'll see that when when people leave the the Protestant church to go to Rome or to the Eastern Orthodox Church, they almost invariably will cite authority as the reason for their departure. They want a church with 400 royal prophets and maybe a cool set of horns. But the authority of God's word comes from the sovereign God that spoke that word, not from the dignity, majesty, or pedigree of the prophets delivering it. God's word is authoritative on its own. Or, as the Reformers put it, God's word is self-authenticating. And then the last point... I'd like to make the last lesson to draw from Ahab's life. I'd like to return to Ahab's strange confliction. Ahab's strange confliction. He was a man who both wanted to be lied to and didn't want to be lied to. It's such a strange and bizarre problem to have, and yet at the same time, it sounds so familiar. You you see it around you all the time, only it's very hard to put your finger on it because it's so bizarre. How can somebody both want to be lied to, and not want to be lied to. It's one that we are all so very easy, uh, easily prone to slip into. First, think of it this way. First, no one, no one, whether Christian or not, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or an unbeliever, nobody consciously wants to be deceived. Nobody, nobody wants to be lied to. When, you've dis- when you discover that you've been lied to, when you find out that you've been tricked, that you've been deceived, you resent it. Nobody, nobody wants to be lied to. But have you, ever been, have you ever been concerned about someone, about how they were doing spiritually, and yet you didn't seek to take it to them? You didn't seek to talk to them about what was going on? 
Have you ever seen parenting that you would like to say something about? Or have you ever seen a man treat his wife in a way that gave you concern, and yet you didn't say anything? And, and why is it you didn't say something? Because we all know, or at least strongly suspect, that it would not be received well. Right? We, we know that that's not going to go over well. And why is it that we know that it wouldn't go over well? Because there's a little bit of kind of reverse golden rule going on here. We know how we would handle it when somebody came with a tough word for us. We all know, or at least strongly suspect, that it would not be received well. We know that, in general, most of us don't actually want to be confronted. We don't want to be told hard things. So there's a golden rule kind of thing that's happening here, where we don't want to be confronted, and so we don't confront. And so we don't talk to others, but that reveals something about ourselves. We don't want to be told the truth about ourselves, and yet... Go back to my first point, we also don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be lied to, and we also really want to be lied to. We don't want to be lied to, but we also don't want to hear the truth. We like, we like to project openness. We like to tell everybody, I'm, I'm open. If you got something, I want to hear it. Please let me know. If you see any problems in me, please let me have it. We like to project uh, openness. And yet at the same time, we're, we get upset or bothered when somebody actually brings um, a concern to us. And we, and we find that we want to retaliate when somebody brings something of concern to us, just as, the, um, as Ahab and Zedekiah struck out against Micaiah. We want to retaliate if somebody brings something to us. And that was Ahab's problem. Ahab's blind insanity, his inability to deal with the options before him, be lied to or don't be lied to, be lied to or be told the truth, his inability to deal with those options was a result of the fact that he could not repent. It wasn't a problem, and this is the thing that you need to notice, it wasn't a problem of whether or not he believed in God. He believed, he completely knew that God existed. He was like the demons who know that God exists and still go to hell. Ahab's problem was that he could not repent. He couldn't let go of his sin. And so he was blinded because he couldn't let go of his sin. He was blinded. And he knew full well that he was being blinded. That's the terrible irony. He was blinded and knew full well that he was being blinded. Augustine says in his, in his book, The Confessions, he said, Thou, O Lord, hast commanded, and so it is, that every disordered mind should be its own punishment. And that's kind of a chilling sentiment. Every disordered mind should be its own punishment. A mind that has been disordered by sin is often its own punishment. We sin, we won't repent, and so the consequences of our stubbornness in our sin is that we are given over to more of our sin. In Romans 1, for example, the idolatry of the pagans is punished by the abominable lust to which they are delivered. Right? The sin that they fall into becomes its own punishment. God hates those lusts, but he uses them as punishment against the idolatry which he also hates. God hates lies, but he hates deception. Ahab is stubborn and unrepentant, and so God gave him over to his own willfully deceived blindedness. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. The unspoken option in all of this, the third way that seems to have never crossed Ahab's mind, is simply repentance. You can always stop, turn to Christ, and ask for forgiveness. There's always the chance to just stop and open up and ask for God's forgiveness. The madness of Ahab is what happens when we don't daily see ourselves inside of Christ. We need to always be seeing ourselves as being in Christ. If I look at myself outside of Christ, and I look at myself on my own, according to my own worth, according to my own achievements, according to my own strength, if I look at myself like that, I have a need to puff myself up. I have a need to paper over all of my flaws, my sins, my weaknesses. I have to paper over it all. I have to be self-deceived because I'm looking at myself outside of Christ, and so my flaws are many. And so I have to cover it all up. I have to deceive myself. And whenever someone points out a flaw in me, it is a subtracting from me. If, somebody, if I'm outside of Christ and somebody shows to me and reveals to me where I'm falling short, it's a subtracting from me. It, d it does damage to me. And that's why I need to be defensive. I need to get revenge. But when I daily understand my need for a Savior and see myself inside of the Son, where His righteousness is my righteousness, then every time something is shown to be lacking inside of me, then it's just a reminder of how much I need my Savior and a chance for me to repent and grow and be more like Him. If somebody points out how I was just a total jerk to my wife, or a failure as a father, or a complete mess of a man, and I am outside of Christ... 
If I'm outside of Christ when that happened, then that criticism rocks me to my foundation. But if I'm in Christ and I see myself in Christ, and I am boasting, as Paul says in Galatians, in nothing but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, then these weaknesses that are exposed in me are just chances for me to be humbled and cling even tighter to my Savior. So when you find yourself in that impossible spot that Ahab was in, where both you want the truth and you don't want the truth. You, you want a truth, you want to be not deceived, you want to be living an open life, and yet the truth is too hard for you to stomach because it would hurt you too much to know that many negative things about yourself. When you find yourself in that predicament, know that these are not your only two options. There is another possibility. Just let go of your pride. Humble yourself. Turn to the Savior that loved you and gave himself for you because when you find yourself in Christ, you don't have to run from the truth. Because in Christ is where the psalmist says in Psalm 85, mercy and truth have, come, have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. So how hard is it to bring those things together, mercy and truth? But they come together in Christ so that the fallen person in Christ can look the truth right in the eyes and be unflinching and not be terrified of it at all, because you're in a, a, a crucified and resurrected Savior. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know and we confess that all things come together in you. Without you, we cannot make sense of our lives. Without you, our pride, our vanity, our uncrucified self cannot deal with the whole cold, hard truths of this world and our place in it. Outside of you, we are deluded. We are compulsive liars screaming for the truth. Father, we thank you that through the death of your son, we were freed from our slavery to self-deception. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for how you make us walk in truth and righteousness through him. We thank you for this kindness, and we pray these things in the name of your son, who taught us to pray, singing. Our Father. The charge is this. Mercy and truth have come together in Jesus. If you are not in him, you can't have either. You become a merciless liar like Ahab, but in Christ all things are made new. So live your life in him, in Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and amen.